So, welcome everyone um, to my talk on uh, Xenomai, building hard real-time systems with Xenomai. Um, so, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Jan Kiskar. I'm working at Siemens Technology, uh, but today I'm standing here as a maintainer, or one of the, the key maintainers of this project. Um, my daily work is, is dealing with embedded Linux for various uh, devices in our company, and as such, I'm also maintaining um, a couple of open source projects, and Xenoma is among them. Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, so today I would like to introduce you to Xenoma if you haven't heard about it, or give you a brief update where we are standing, and, and also what people are doing with it. So. Why so Xenomai? Some examples I have brought with me. A um, little bit look under the hood of it. Uh, how to set it up if you want to play around with it. Um, also look a bit into our community um, and the challenges comes with it. And uh, give you a summary on that. So maybe if we talk about these days about what real-time and Linux, what would you associate with real-time and Linux these days? Uh, with real time, you may have something in mind like, okay, it's some serious uh, time critical work that has to be done. And okay, if I want to do it with Linux, um, then I will use Pram.t. Natural choice. You probably will not think immediately about using Xenomai instead of that. And uh, you would probably not associate if you are thinking about real time Linux. Um, and Xenomai that uh, you may have been in contact with it, hopefully not, um, at a doctor or at a hospital. Um, that comes into that play, but you may also wonder why that Emmy is here. I will come to that later on as well. So first of all, why, why is preemptor omnipresent and, and how does it work in a nutshell? I mean, I'm not going to explain in all details how it works, it would be too complicated. But just to give you the idea, and, and, and the benefit of preempt.it is clearly that this enhances the existing kernel ABI to provide um, certain real-time paths through the kernel to the hardware and back. That's the great advantage. In theory, you don't have to touch your, your application. You don't have to touch your drivers. You don't have to touch, um, well, anything. At least this is one stuff that some people are dreaming of. Um, in practice, in some cases, it actually works like this by making the kernel itself way more preemptible it is. Right? It's, it's always this trade-off between performance and, and determinism. Um, here we are with preemptor really behind the determinism. The short reaction time often, deterministic reaction times, and for that preemptor T paves you the way towards the kernel. And obviously the other thing which is a key asset of the preemptor T approach, it's going to be merged into the kernel next year. So maybe really next year this time, we are really looking forward with this. Um, and that also obviously makes it quite present and quite easily accessible. Um, that is not the case with the other solutions uh, I will talk about. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the, the benefit of preemptor In contrast, um, there is another concept to achieve real time with Linux, and that's um, the co-kernel approach. And Xenoma is implementing this approach. Xenoma is not the first one to implement it. There have been solutions uh, around a long while ago, like uh, RT Linux, um, RT, RT Core, uh, RTI, and, and others. Um, but Xenoma is the one, I would say, who survived them all and is now still standing and providing that solution. So what is the difference to preemptor T? So preemptor T was this unified or is this unified approach to the kernel, while the co-kernel, as the name already suggests, there are two kernels. Well, actually, they're not complete separate kernels, but at least there are different schedulers and there are different paths to the kernel for these different purposes. So the real-time paths are handled by a real-time scheduler, which is separate from the standard Linux scheduler. And um, the underlying layer, in this case, uh, IPipe or Dovetail, we'll come to this later on, they basically enable you to receive also certain external events separately and, and before the rest of the Linux kernel, so you get a faster pass directly to the real-time scheduler. Also, the real-time scheduler um, is at basically any time, not quite true in technical details, but in uh, way easier is possible for the real-time scheduler to interrupt the Linux scheduler. 
So you have a different level of preemptability here. How much it actually is in the end depends obviously on the hardware, but in, in concept wise, uh, preemption can be done at any point where there is no really critical synchronization points between the two. Um, this is not a hypervisor approach, just to be clear. Um, so we have a collaborative model here. The kernels or the code bases of the schedulers in the kernel are still in the same code base or in the same um, uh, security domain. Um, and also, this is the other thing, obviously, about that um, the, the application process using this real-time scheduler is not running on a different operating system. It's really the same application that you are spawning here can have real-time tasks and non-real-time tasks using these different schedulers while being one process. So the programming model is not identical to standard Linux application, but it's very close to it. Also, the way how you debug these things and how you, yeah, how you interact with these things. Now, the question is, why should I want like to have this? Um, and even in the time of preemptive T and its omnipresence, there are three major reasons uh, why people are still using co-kernels with Linux and are still uh, biting the uh, or taking the effort to maintain these differences. So one comes from the area of um, you may have an existing software stack coming from Atos, coming from homegrown operating systems, which is not quite POSIX. Well, because this is what Linux implements normally, um, which are quite uh, slightly different. I mean, it can be sometimes just how exactly uh, how many priorities you have or how exactly the scheduler behaves in certain scenarios. Um, and if this is not exactly mappable on a POSIX system, but your application stacks consisting of a few million lines of code actually relies on that, you may port it over, but it may also be hard to find the engineers who can still do that. Um, and that's basically where the co-kernel comes into play by being able to modify the scheduler for that specific purposes without harming the standard use cases we like for Linux and all the negative impact it can bring on, on throughput and other aspects of the Linux scheduler. Um, also, the tunings, is, is, there are different ways to tune these systems. Um, also, while still using the same tuning, the same performance optimized tuning for your Linux part. So you can have different tunings for the different schedulers in the same system. While with Linux, you have to decide, okay, I want to be preempt none or I want to be preempt RT. I can't say I want to be preempt none on that core and preempt RT on the other, at least not up to date. You can also build additional APIs if needed, um, yeah, and, and simply model existing RTOSs. And this is what people did in the past as well and are still doing, that we are still doing even in some cases, um, just to make the porting of an application stack more, more handleable. Another reason to use that, um, this, this separate architecture, it first of all comes from the kernel perspective, it's quite some cost, um, but it comes with, for the user's space, uh, also has some advantages. So with preemptor T, if you're using a preemptor T application uh, and libraries in between you, uh, system calls, you don't know what, um, you're always kind of unsure, am I really now on this sweet spot path where preemptor T can actually guarantee me certain reaction times? Um, and that's not easy to find out, depending on the kernel version, depending on your external dependencies, libraries I mentioned, uh, pulling in, maybe some of them actually randomly do malloc or something else in between. You never really know uh, for sure. With the co-kernel approach and the separation you have, um, that brings uh, architecturally some clearer paths between these two uh, execution environments, and that can provide the application and way earlier a signal um, you are leaving the known good path. Um, and that's actually what Xenomai can provide to the application, saying, okay, once my critical application has been initialized with all the malloc and all the dynamics coming with initialization, I turn on, I'm now in operational mode, and if I'm leaving that mode, for example, by calling uh, a system call of Linux, um, or by allocating memory, by touching memory, which is uh, not yet ready uh, for, for access, then I'm getting a signal. I can early debug, so to say, my misbehaving real-time applications. So if you have complex, library or complex application stacks, or you have to maintain them, also with developers who may have to change uh, code paths uh, while not being fully aware of, of, of real-time and real-time properties, that can be beneficial. 
And last but not least, um, some people tell us um, that there is actually some cases where this uh, co-kernel approach still delivers better latencies. If that really matters, well, it depends obviously on your use case. Um, if you're looking for 10 times better latencies, mm, sorry, we can't. Uh, but if you are basically with your latency requirement on the edge, what preemptive currently can deliver, you may want to have some safety margin. Or actually it can lift you over the edge uh, positively and you get actually into an area where you can achieve things which are not yet achievable with PMDRT. Um, that specifically bites on lower end platforms. Um, that specifically bites also when you are condensed. So you have to have the real time workload and the non real time workload on the same core. This is where we see more significant uh, difference in the latency with PMDRT, even on more performant platform than with the co-kernel approach. It can also help in some scenarios when you're scaling up, um, although there is, there is some issue with, with at least with the legacy uh, architecture of, of Xenoma as well regarding scaling. But we have also running systems where we reduced um, the real-time part to a number of cores and the few other dozens of cores are doing non-real-time performance workload and that happily lives by side by side. So the other cores, the other dozens of cores, they don't have to bite the overhead um, that brings normally the high parameterability with it. So, as I said, um, I'm working for a company who builds some stuff in this area. Um, so I'd like to present you two use cases that we have for Xenoma. It's also the reason why I'm still doing that. Um, the, at Siemens, we have, um, for example, the portfolio um, of motion control machines, um, or motion controllers uh, for, well, drilling machines um, and other things. Um, and, and they have a quite demanding real-time requirements um, because, well, the faster the system are, the higher the accuracy is, the better the output is. Um, so they're really after these lower latencies. Um, they also have a system which is uh, predating, um, not predating Linux, but close to, um, predating, but also predating uh, PrimeDT and predating uh, even Xenomai, um, and they cannot easily change this from one day to the other. So we are in a constant process of adjusting the APIs and reducing in them to more and more POSIX, but still specifically for the initial step to get the, the software stack over on the Linux platform, um, it was very helpful and it's still very helpful to have flexibility in the API providing here. And last but not least, the colleagues are also quite after long-term support as these machines uh, or these devices live um, yeah, easily a decade or longer. Another use case, and this brings me back to my, my earlier slide, is from our uh, healthiness colleagues, Siemens Healthiness. Um, so for quite a while, I think by now it's also about 15 years, they are running um, the, the, the data processing unit and control unit for these magnetic resonance imaging systems. Uh, on Linux and on Xenomai. So not the whole thing is done with Xenomai, but there are critical parts. Um, as you can imagine, the control of these uh, measurements, um, when certain coils have to be um, uh, yeah, stimulated in certain ways, when the measurement has to be collected, that is time sensitive. Um, it's not immediately that the patient is in danger, but on the other hand, the patients usually are not for fun inside these machines, so the measurement really has to work reliably. So this is a critical operation. The software stack is quite complex, um, as you can imagine, and it also it's a mixture in the sense of having certain control elements, real-time elements, and a lot of data processing, number crunching, I would call it, uh, to get this huge amount of data out of the measurements and, and, and uh, in the end uh, towards a, a terminal to visualize the results. So we have this co-location of a complex software stack, real-time, non-real-time, and the colleagues really enjoy that there is a clear separation between the both and that not all developers have to be deep kernel experts in order to write uh, applications which behave still properly on the real-time path, but they get the information early. And also we benefit from the fact that, as I said, the impact, um, the performance impact of, of uh, the co-kernel approach on the non-real-time part is, um, at least the last time we measured, is still uh, quite uh, low. So that's, that's our use cases, but there's way more outside. Um, and that brings me to the Emmy, actually. So have you imagined that you watched a movie possibly recently, which was uh, shot by the help of Xenomai? 
Um, so there's an interesting company which actually is doing motion control as well as we are doing, but for different purposes. Motion control in order to enable um, actors to interact with, with uh, models of, of, uh, yeah, of characters in the movie, um, which also enable them to interact or to, to, to act on, on platforms which are moving, um, or to interact also with virtual uh, models which have been, will, will be rendered later on uh, for the final, final movie. So Concept Overdrive is providing this kind of solutions. Um, so it's a mixture of standard components and, and obviously also specialized, customized solutions for the individual movies. Um, they're doing it also for quite a while. Um, and um, originally they did it um, on, on embedded controllers, later on an RT core, so these, these older real-time systems. And in the past years, they have migrated over to Xenomai 3. And um, there's a very interesting talk I can only recommend by, by Steve Rosenblatt, uh, CEO of this company, of, on last year's Xenobi Meetup. Um, still online available. Watch it. And it's a mixture of interesting instructional technology as well as the connection to the movies. Um, so be warned, the pictures I'm showing here, actually, they are probably not taken with Xenobi yet. But there's a list <laughs> he shared uh, beforehand of, of recent um, movies that are now with a new architecture taken. Um, and actually, that's maybe something to show one example. Whoop. Where is it? No, not, not. Ah, here is it. He just shared it three minutes before the talk. So thanks, thanks Steve, a lot. Um, that's um, uh, Dungeons and Dragons um, film recently shot, and that was taken with a new architecture. So yeah, maybe you've seen it on, on movies um, that uh, real time is not about only uh, industrial control or healthcare systems. It can be also like this. I really like this case a lot um, because it's a little a mixture of, of this application that we do as well with a complete different domain, way more interesting than our domain. Another use case, um, audio. So there's a company, a Swedish company uh, called Elk Audio. Um, they're providing um, yeah, some kind of, of solutions um, and, and building blocks for doing uh, low latency um, audio solutions. Um, I think they also have a, a live jamming offering there. And, and one of the building blocks for them is an uh, well, embedded Linux distribution called Elk OS, Elk Audio OS, uh, which is tuned for, for low latency audio. Um, so they have supported a number of these common embedded boards to build your, your own audio solutions. Um, and they are now using um, Xenomai for quite a while, um, formerly three, and now they actually have migrated just recently on the latest version. Um, and that's a citation of them, um, to achieve extremely low hard real-time performances. So they actually support both Preemptati and Xenomai, uh, but they say, okay, in most cases you might be fine with uh, the standard Preemptati, but it's really about this lowest latency real-time performance that gives you the best audio experience, then you have to go that path. So yeah, that's also very interesting uh, architecture um, and, and solution. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually, and if you go for the website, they have um, the code public on, on GitHub, so you can look it up and see how they actually integrate um, with Xenomai, how the application looks like, how they address these different um, operation modes as well. So if you're in music, I'm not, uh, at least not at this level, uh, you'll probably find also some interesting links how they achieve that. Okay, now let's have a look under the hood of this thing. So how do we build up the Xenomai stack? So the foundation for Xenomai is, uh, first of all, um, a number of kernel patches, and this is common to the different Xenomai version we currently have in the field. It's called the dovetail patch. Um, that enables uh, this split up of incoming interrupts and other events into these two domains, Linux or real-time. Um, and that we maintain, so to say, as the must-have patch on top of a kernel. Um, we support a number of LTS kernel with that, um, steadily moving forward. Um, so currently there are four LTS kernel in the field. Um, probably this is something we have to adjust in the future regarding, well, how many hands we have on that topic. Architecture-wise, we are on ARM, 32-bit, 64-bit on an x86, obviously. And that's quite some interest, but still some way to go to get it on risk five, although at least some people are working on this. As that, this is common for the most major version we currently have in the field and how it's being presented. So if you're dealing with maybe not just the plain vanilla LTS kernel, but if you have to uh, struggle with a vendor kernel, um, we provide both a rebase patch queue 
which allows you to more easily get that queue, hopefully, onto a, a vendor kernel, as well as a continuously merging branch, so that you can also see basically what's changing along the LTS updates. Just for reference, uh, in the past, for the older kernel version, we had the IPy patch that still shows up. And as this also the adoption of these technology is sometimes a bit slower in that industry, you will probably still find a lot of references to IPy in the field. Um, that is basically up to the 4.5, the 5.4 kernel, um, and it's only supported by Xenomai up to release 3.2. And we have also some older kernels here still in maintenance uh, based on the civil infrastructure long-term kernel. So I already mentioned there are two major versions. Um, so what are the major difference between them? The commodity we already discussed, the baseline kernel patch for Xenomai 3 series. And that's what probably most of the users currently are on. Uh, that consists, first of all, of another kernel change. This is an out of tree, think of a driver, out of tree kernel code base, the Cobalt core, the scheduler, um, plus its libraries. This is user space then. This core emulates a POSIX API natively as a ABI to user space. And on top, you then have either directly the POSIX library interface, so a second libc, so to say, for the um, scheduling relevant uh, functions, um, or you may have on top further libraries in order to emulate some artoses or your own flavor of, of API. Um, in that model, the core or the real-time drivers that we have in the core are well, kind of forks or rewrites against a special API in the kernel, the real-time driver model. Um, there are a couple of them, but don't expect to be as, as many as you have with the Linux kernel, obviously, because also a lot of the hardware is not really real-time capable by nature, so it doesn't make sense to write riders for them. But still, this subset of drivers is, is limited. What users often then do, they come with their own driver source code in, and, and uh, implement it basically custom uh, for their specific hardware they're designing. So the, the Xenomai 3 series, uh, as I said, is currently um, uh, various products, and that's also the reason why we currently have three stable series under maintenance, from 3.0 to 3.2. And that may also be reduced in the future based on feedback and based on our available capacity to maintain them, but currently it's quite easy for me, well, I'm the maintainer of this branch here, uh, to handle the backports of the patches and to keep hopefully everyone happy with it. So that's for the Xenomai 3 path. Now there is even less, as it's called, EVL, Xenomai 4. Um, that is driven by the former Xenomai maintainer, Philip Jerome. Um, so we basically handed over all the legacy stuff to me, and he was happy to, to drive this new activity um, with the goal to really reduce this co-kernel approach to its course again. Uh, that comes with some uh, price as well, because we are cutting off certain features. At the same time, it comes with the benefit of being well less, means ideally being faster, being more maintainable. So the EVL core, that's the, the pendant, so to say, to the Cobalt core, um, is differently maintained in the sense it comes with a, as a kernel patch pre-integrated. So you get the dovetail patches, and on top you get another branch which contains then the EVL scheduler patches in a kernel tree. So you don't have to deal with the integration. We will see it later on um, that you have on the Xenomai 3 side. Um, it has an own ABI. It's separate. It's not POSIX. Um, so there's also currently no foreseen path to emulate legacy artists with this approach. Also, the drivers that are available, so for example, for the, for the audio scenarios, um, they are uh, actually in-kernel drivers enhanced by a separate um, yeah, out-of-band code path to enable the real-time code path. So you interact with a driver basically like you interact in the Linux with a driver, except that there is a special mode you can switch on that the, the event path and then the data path goes in um, via this uh, co-kernel. That works quite well for some drivers. For others, well, you end up still having to, to rewrite certain things because simply the original kernel driver is not, not designed for, for real-time purposes. Um, the goal of this approach regarding maintenance is currently two LTS kernels in flight, um, plus there's always a head of tree um, where Philip is maintaining the latest version for the latest kernel. So that's the Xenomai 4 path. Now, brief look into if you want to try it out. So you see for Xenomai 3, um, you have to fetch basically two uh, essential artifacts. The one is first of all Xenomai itself, 
So this project consisting of the libraries and the COBOL scheduler um, as a release or as the, the Git branch. Um, then you have to pick up the dovetail patches and with this already um, the, the kernel. In the past, we had the kernel patches separately distributed. We no longer do this simply because there was not too much interest in that path, at least for most users we heard about. So it's just the kernel tree available. Um, you have to check out the respective branch there that you want to have, which version. And then you have to marry these two elements, the kernel element coming from the Xenoma code base with the dovetail kernel. And that's done with the script here um, to basically run um, this kind of unification. It's kind of entry patching or integration of this. The advantage of this is that we can maintain mostly independent of the kernel version, the scheduler. We don't have to rebase it continuously over the kernel tree. The price is that the integration obviously is a little bit more tricky. Then you can compile the kernel and next would be then going to the Xenomai code base and there compiling the user space part. So the library there and the tools available there. So that's in a nutshell the from scratch approach if you do this on a distribution or if you do this for your embedded system um, in the build system there. For Xenomai 4 things look a bit different because of as I said um, the, all the kernel pieces come from one tree so you can just clone here a different kernel tree the EVL Linux EVL tree and you have all the needed kernel changes in one tree, um, configure and compile it, done. And then you fetch um, the library part, which also contains a few benchmark tools, just like the my above also contains benchmark and testing tools. And then you have the userland part. And those together basically makes your real-time system. Or if you do not like to write C anymore, um, there's also Rust binding by now available. It's not yet complete, but this is uh, supposed to be done early next year. So if all of this is still too complicated, we also have a third option um, that is currently only targeting um, the Xenomai 3, but this is going to be fixed in a couple of upcoming days. Um, that basically builds you a uh, ready-to-use uh, mini Debian system with Xenomai uh, pre-installed, with pre-configured all the tools and libraries you need. Uh, basically what you need is just to have a Docker running, in this case a privileged Docker locally, and you can just um, clone this repository and, and run the build instruction. Well, we, first of all, you can select basically what you want to build, which kernel configuration, which Xenomai configuration, and for which target you want to build. So all architectures are supported. Um, as I said, currently only Xenomai 3. EVL is on the way, so it also will be covered soon. And we have a couple of, well, we have QM images, obviously, so if you really just want to try out how it feels, but don't look after latency, obviously, in Xenomai and in QEMO. But we also have generic x86, uh, Bigglebone Black for the ARM side and, and the high key for the ARM64 side, and there will be more added in the future. It's not very hard to add further boards on that. Yeah, and it's also nice to have because it's, uh, you have the baby Debian system running then, and you can also then obviously play around and modify the system on the fly. Um, and that's actually also the baseline if you want a little bit of a product out of this or a real integration, you can use this layer also as a, as a baseline to then do your own customization on top. That tool is, is prepared for, for enabling the stacking. It's a little bit like similar like, like Yocto works in this regard as well, except that it pulls from the Debian distribution. So, um, talked about technology a lot, but there's more for an open source project that's the community. And looking at the Xenomai project, I mean, it's been around actually for more than 20 years now, which is quite a long time. Um, what also has been since then basically around are most of the challenges we are facing. So first of all, we have a user community. We know that. Um, sometimes we even know them personally, but that's where it stops because they cannot speak up. Um, even, even in 2023, it's still problematic for some companies to talk about what they're actually doing. It's also why I appreciate a lot these uh, or open contributions of our users talking about their use cases. Um, so we get also let very little feedback in regarding how Xenoma is actually being used. Um, what is relevant, what is no longer relevant? Which version are you using mostly, which not? Um, up to the point that they actually try to remove a subsystem and only then when the patch was about to be merged to mainline, the user spoke up and said, oh, but I'm using it. Okay, now. Okay, um, so yeah, this is really a challenge for that community, given that the domain we are targeting, despite all these use cases are shown, is comparably small. Um, the other aspect is um, that, as you can imagine, digging into the kernel, hooking all that up is not a beginner's task. So it can be quite problematic to adjust or to diagnose and adjust certain things in the kernel. 
So the number of these people who are really uh, familiar within all the internals are few, uh, while we need them to maintain the systems over all the time. On the other side, you see, again, we have been around for 20 years. The problem is solvable and has been resolved so far. No major outage on that side. And an also interesting aspect that I only learned uh, the other years very recently is that we have an even larger community apparently in China right now, um, while the project originally comes from Europe. So how do you deal with that? So what we did in the past years um, is we try to improve the transparency of our workflow um, to, to make it more um, open to, for others to, to join the project and to contribute to that. Um, that is the thing. If you don't get feedback, uh, why should I work openly? No, it's, uh, there's always the discussion. If I, if I now invest into be more transparent, be more explicit, and no one really gives us feedback, why should I do that? But on the other hand, if you don't do that, you will never get feedback. So this is actually one of the investments we did in the past years. Um, we also try to get more developers on board and really con, uh, yeah, bound to the project. Um, well, for me, on, on, on the company side, it was easier because I could more friendly ask my colleagues to, could you join the project? I have some tasks for you. Would you like to help here? And this is what happened. So we have more engineers on our side involved. We also like to see it from other companies as well. Uh, and just to be mentioned, uh, in this case, uh, Intel joined the project three years ago, basically bringing in also information. By the way, you know China is using this a lot. And they also granted some engineers on this topic, which is highly appreciated. Uh, what we do now these days, also again, initiative for Intel, we have a bi-weekly community call. You can just dial in. It's friendly to the, it's not friendly to the US side, but it's friendly to the Asian folks because it's uh, early in the morning of Germany, later in the, more, uh, in the evening of, of uh, uh, Japan and China. But anyway, it's open for everyone. You can join it and you can follow and ask questions this way if it's not on the mailing list or other channels. Uh, we had a virtual meetup last year, um, which initially was targeting a physical meetup, but for some reasons it wasn't still possible. Interesting outcome of this, the usual crowd, I would say, the usual amount of participation from, from Europe, from the Western world, and over 90% from China. And the numbers were also quite impressive. So that was one of the reasons why we had this workshop just two weeks, uh, last week actually, in Wuxi. Um, not hundreds of people, but at least we were about 50 from different um, corners, uh, different companies, but um, that interest shows quite strongly there have been companies representing um, application scenarios. There have been universities showing research on that. And it's, it's, it's quite impressive and quite interesting to see how the community is evolving there, so to say, not directly visible for us. And we try to engage with them. So to summarize, um, my summary is here. Co-Kernel is here to stay. Um, as I said, we have been around for 20 years. Um, and although there is the default choice, most likely for most of us, to use PreMTT. Also for us at Siemens, we have more PreMTT use cases and we have Xenoma use cases. Um, the Xenoma use cases are not apparently going to go away. Um, so they are valid use cases, I pointed out. Um, so this is a good to have this choice. There are different versions now of Xenoma, as I said. Uh, the project keeps evolving. It's not evolving like cloud technology. I guess it's probably also a good thing. Uh, the pace is slow but steady. Um, and, but we're also committed to be really uh, supporting these solutions for a long, very long time uh, because this is what our users expect from us. So we're happy to take more active users. Um, stand up, provide feedback if you are using already. And if you will be using, also do that, please. Uh, we need them. Otherwise, we may make choices on the project side which are not in your favor. But then, yeah, you ask for it. With that, thank you for your attention. And I'm open to take questions. So one of the things I think is missing for both Zenomai and uh, PreemptRT, uh, maybe I'm not aware of it, is uh, published like benchmark numbers on your real-time latencies. So both <laughs> projects have a marketing problem. Yeah, that, that's the point. I mean, I've seen a lot of benchmark in the past 20 years, as long as I'm doing real-time Linux. Um, and some of them are, hmm, they shouldn't have been published in this form. Um, others were helpful. Others were more harmful because people were deciding based on 5% difference what technology to choose. 
um, when I'm in internal discussions about, okay, what real-time Linux do you recommend? I say, don't start with the benchmark numbers unless you can really explain to me you are so close to the limits. Um, the problem with benchmarking is, as you know, it depends on where you're running it, how you're running it, how you're tuning it. Um, if you stop when you have the numbers or if you start to understand the numbers and, and try to dig deeper and, and make sure that you really benchmark correctly both sides. So just to give an example, I ask uh, internally, please redo the benchmarks between Xenoma 3 and Xenoma 4. Um, the numbers currently are not presentable, uh, simply because it's not really in favor of Xenoma 4. But this is our fault. I've seen numbers from Xenoma 4, which were way better. Uh, depends on, again, what mistakes you make along the line. And this is actually, although Xenoma is sometimes easier to configure, you can still make certain mistakes, or the hardware can make certain mistakes to ruin the whole benchmarking thing. I always recommend to everyone, if you have a case, benchmark your representative use case, not just the latency test like everyone is doing. So the, the representative I.O. benchmark on your platform and then come to a conclusion if this if the benchmark wise makes a difference for you. The other reason, as I said, for using a co-kernel approach, if any of them applies, you may consider it. And if none of them complies, use preemptivity. My gosh, this is the standard. Uh, so if I understand correctly, there are two uh, schedulers. So does the application need to be aware of that to pass it on to the uh, real-time uh, scheduler than the normal one? Yeah, to a certain degree. Um, so that, that, that depends a bit on the version. Um, and it's, it's interesting also from our perspective, we still have to, I guess, look into that further. Um, so with Xenomai 3, we have a mode where you link with a linker trick, you link against POSIX and every, every thread that you create with real-time priorities are automatically uh, handled by the real-time scheduler. Unless you explicitly, that again is when you put in something in the code, say, okay, but I want to be this on Linux only, even if it's real-time. So this is almost transparent. With EVL, you have a clear API separation. And if you look, for example, in that Elk Audio code base, you find there different code paths to create an, uh, a real-time thread against the EVL API. Um, so this is their pros and cons between both. It's more explicit to have a separate API, but again, if you're porting over a large code base or if you want to make a large code base compatible with both, there's a disadvantage. So my colleague actually asked me if I now want to port over to Xenoma 4, I have to rewrite my application again, and you just promoted me to use POSIX, and now there is no POSIX. So there might be POSIX for EVL for Xenoma 4 in the future. Um, that's something we're currently considering. It's not impossible, but it's not the, the current default path and nothing which is today available. Further questions? Okay. Otherwise, I'm still around. Um, you can talk to me on this topic or other topics as you like. Thanks for your attention. Hope to see you.